Brambro back with some Grand Tactician Civil War, our CSA campaign. We're now into March 1862, so winter is drawing to a close. In another three weeks or so, the winter uh, weather debuffs will be lifted. Movement will be normal speed again. Supply and attrition will be normal in a new series of maneuvers and campaigns, uh, the activity is going to pick up. It ha Activity had pretty much slowed down. We've gone a couple episodes now without a field battle on the tactical map. Partially that's because of weather, I think. However, the Union armies did repeatedly hit us. Um, quite far into the winter. I think we had a couple of battles in December. Well, the, there's a official record here. Yeah, we had a battle at Fort Carroll. That was a siege that we turned into, that we chose to turn into a tactical battle. But we had a battle at St. Louis and on December 18th. We had a battle at Washington, D.C. on December 10th. We had a, pre, uh, a previous battle. We battle at St. Louis on December 3rd. And a couple of battles in November, which is winter uh, weather. So the Union was quite active earlier in the winter, and then they kind of tapered off. So just the season might be part of that. But I kind of think that factors such as morale, readiness, and finances uh, might have been factors as well. So it's entirely possible that as the weather warms up here into spring, the Union may stay a little bit more passive than they were in 1861. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I do know that basically the, you know, there's been a fair amount of fighting up here in Maryland, Northern Virginia. But the main story of this campaign has largely played out in Missouri. Sterling Price's army started in well, right on the border here between Arkansas and Missouri and, and steadily worked up this route. Several battles along the way in here. There was a battle at Carrollton. I think there was one at Springfield. The Lebanon-Rolla line captured St. Louis. And then there have been, I think, six, at, at least five, maybe six battles right here at St. Louis. Initially, as we captured the city, and then Union armies have made repeated attempts to retake. All of them unsuccessful thus far. And now we're in a state where Price's Army of, the, of Missouri, which consists of John Marmaduke's Corps, <laughs> but we've got, uh, we've got a, a supply depot, in two forts now in the St. Louis area. We have not, however, induced Missouri to secede and join the Confederacy. We have a lot of support. We have, the Confederacy has 69% support now in Missouri. At, game, at campaign start, it was either 45 or perhaps 50%. But it is still a Union state, and I think, we talked about this a number of times, we, we seem to have fulfilled the requirements, which is capture St. Louis and defeat every Union army in, in Missouri, but I'm not sure that we did it in sequence, because this army over here, Army of the West, has been defeated but it hasn't been defeated since we captured St. Louis. So I think maybe this is the lone uh, remaining step in that process. 
By capturing St. Louis, I've kind of immobilized Marmaduke's Corps in the sense that I don't feel like, you know, I can leave. Otherwise, <laughs> the, the Army of Kentucky and the Army of the Mississippi will just come back, even with these forts here. Uh, they'll just come back in and retake the city as soon as Marmaduke steps out of it. So, I, you know, I can't really chase this force with Marmaduke's uh, core, with, which is Sterling Price's army. Meanwhile, this army of the West is estimated to be only 6,500 men. I don't need a force of, you know, I don't need Marmaduke's full core of something like 20,000 men. So with that in mind, I have created, remember when we did the big uh, musical chair shuffle in Corps and Army Command to stand up these Army HQs, the loser in that little game was Joe Johnston. Well, Johnston has a command. I have just formed a little bitty core down here at the Capitol. And it is not a proper core. It is uh, four infantry brigades and two artillery battalions. So that's going to be something like uh, 12,000 12, men. They are full-size brigades. So this is not an inconsiderable force, but we're not dedicating a whole core, and this force is still small enough that it can f travel fully within the capacity of our rail system, which, by the way, has expanded. It has improved. At campaign start, back uh, in one of the earliest episodes, when I discussed uh, plans for army organization, at that time we had a rail capacity of about 80, which is sufficient to transport 16,000 men. And our capacity has increased to about 100. So the Confederate rail system can transport at the fullest speed and at base cost about 20,000 men. So that's been an improvement over the first uh, really about nine months of the war. It's, you know, it started here in, uh, well, about about year. You know, the war started in April 1861 at Fort Sumter. And, of course, didn't really, really get going until summer. And here in March 1862, we've got more rail capacity. And that's due to uh, transportation subsidies. And so partly due to uh, military, too. I think, I think that was one of the subsidies that was uh, increased. Our river capacity is up. I think, as well. In any case, right now this Corps is still under the overall command of Samuel Cooper uh, at Army HQ, but he will soon be cut loose, and I'm just going to have this Corps operate uh, either independently, or I'm, I may put him underneath Price's uh, command. But the first step the first job for Johnson's Corps is he's going to come up here and deal with the Army of the West. And then I think what I might do with him is, you know, I pointed this out in an earlier episode, Leavenworth is actually an extremely valuable city. Now the city itself in the 1860s, Leavenworth, Kansas, there is no Kansas City yet. The city itself is nothing, but where it is, I mean, this is the gateway to the west, and there's there's land trade nodes over here to places like Colorado, New Mexico, Oregon. That's why this city is important and carries a 10. And then St. Joseph, Missouri is the other 
I call it named city. Of course, all the little towns have names, but these larger towns uh, actually, you know, give you points, give you control over territory, uh, and are big enough where their capture or uh, loss affects national morale. So I think we're going to have Johnson come up here, defeat Army of the West, continue on, take Leavenworth, and take St. Joseph. Maybe then come up and could take Davenport, <laughs> Dubuque, St. Paul. I don't know about all that. We'll have to see. But, uh, or, or, how about, uh, oh, never mind. There's no point to taking Dallas. That's, <laughs> that's Confederate. <laughs> I don't think I need to. All right. Well, I know I just started this uh, episode. However, something just popped up. Real world, I got to do for a second. So I'm going to put a cut in right here. I'll be right back. Anyway, so there's some thoughts there about uh, our new little bitty core under Joe Johnston. And I think I'm just going to have him operate independently. Which kind of goes against everything I said about, hey, it's always worth having an army HQ. And I could set up an army HQ for Johnson. Well, I'm kind of talking myself into doing that now. Maybe I will. I don't know. Anyway, another job, little job that he might be able to do is, you know, we just have completely ignored Fort Pickens down here. And maybe I could have Johnson's little force come down here and take out Fort Pickens and put him on the train and come up here and take uh, Fort Monroe. Now, there's actually 5,000 troops at Fort Monroe under the command of Benjamin Butler. Hey, but he, he may be able to do that, too. I don't know. We'll just have to see. I've created just kind of a little flex force that can train around the map and do little, you know, put out little fires. Meanwhile, things have been happening up here in the east uh, over the last couple episodes. We've not precipitated a field battle, but... The Army of Northern Virginia, now under the command of Robert E. Lee, finally, um, besieged and captured Fort Washington, came over here. We have captured Annapolis, Maryland, which is actually the capital of Maryland, not Baltimore. And we have besieged and captured Fort McHenry. At the other end of Maryland... Uh, Beauregard's force, which is Allegheny Johnson's Corps, have crossed the Upper Potomac and have captured Cumberland, Maryland. So I think the next step here is Patterson's army, the Department of Pennsylvania, if Patterson is still in command of this, is sitting in Baltimore. Baltimore is a nice, juicy 10-point uh, city. I think it's time to go after this. I'm going to wait until Jackson hits green readiness shouldn't be too long he's right in the middle of yellow <clears throat> but as soon as the what is their supply status 100 percent and 100 percent i do notice we had a supply depot sitting right here that is now gone yeah connected depots none if that depot were it's not just that it's visually not there for a moment due to some kind of game uh, glitch huh they are in 100% supply, but I'm not really sure where that supply is coming from. I'm not seeing the... Huh. 
I may have to build another depot here. Anyway, let's get time rolling. France messing around in Mexico. Let's, let's check where the national morale is. Union is down to 34 national morale. They still have a lot of support for the cause in all of the Union states. And the morale of their armies is still quite high. Matter of fact, it's higher than ours. And I think that is primarily because they're all sitting on home territory, whereas we're at a point now where the majority of our armies are on Union territory. That's why our morale is a little bit lower. But still quite high at 83 itself. So we're in good shape there. So their army morale is high and their national support remains high, but their, but their national morale among the civilian population uh, is... Uh, we're, we're getting close to the end. <laughs> Nine points to go. And we actually have more men in uniform than the Union does. Now, we've been doing a lot of fort building, and I have actually put, inf not full size, but I've put 1,500-man infantry brigades in a lot of our forts. So, due to the fort garrisons, and then we've got, you know, we've got uh, Johnston's little bitty corps, and we have that little engineer corps running around. If you subtract those out... In the, in the five main field armies, the real combat forces, uh, it's probably a little bit closer than this. They have increased the size of their navy. Speaking of which, the, that main battle force I've been working on creating over the winter, it's almost done. The frigates are built. And CSS Virginia is now at 91%. And should be ready in about another month. And then we can uh, execute our naval strategy down in the Gulf of Mexico that I've talked about a couple times. Also, these smaller ironclads. We, we're just about ready to create a riverine. Uh, battle force as well. We've got four tin clads that are complete and we're at 99 percent on this little group of ironclad gunboat rams. So pretty soon we're going to have a pretty strong naval squadron available on the rivers as well. All right. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we, we had that battle here at Fort Carroll, which was successful, but the fort completely got wrecked in the process. So this is actually the Fort Carroll garrison out of the fort, <laughs> rebuilding it. So for at least for the time being, they are considered a field force, not a garrison. At least while they're outside of their little uh, shell. <laughs> and I guess they're rebuilding their own little fort. And then once it's complete, like we saw with Fort Beckham earlier, they'll pop right back into it. And we have issued bonds to support uh, our expenditures. The forces that I put in Johnson's Corps were pre-existing that had already been recruited by Bragg. So I think he should be 
Yeah, he's completely uh, manned up now. And he's just reached into just now about to hit green readiness already which is plenty enough to move him up closer to Missouri. Let's move him up to... Let's move him up to Memphis. Okay, we have reached our Industrialization 2 policy, which I selected in order to try to speed up artillery and cavalry weapon uh, production. We also get some more ironclad uh, designs available. We'll take a look at those in a second. I'm not exactly sure what we get there. And I think our neck uh, wrong tab. Um, I think we were going to, I think I was going to go for impressment next. Let's do that. And let's have Johnson. John Stun move up to Memphis using rail if we can. I'm just going to enable all of them, but rail will be how he gets there. And then from Memphis, we can move him up river to. Cairo. And from Cairo would be a good spot to start marching into Missouri toward Nathaniel Lyon. Or the Arkansas River is navigable, I think. Maybe move him to Fort Smith and march north from there. That would work. It's spelled exactly the same, but the state is pronounced Arkansas. This river, same name on paper, is pronounced Arkansas. <laughs> English is a funny language. American English is a funnier language. I don't know if that is tied to a policy or if that is just a historical flavor headline. Fugitive Slave Act. I think that's just historical flavor. I, that doesn't seem to tie to a union policy. How's Jackson doing? Longstreet's doing fine. Jackson is ja Jackson is almost green. Yeah, I, I've seen this in previous campaigns too, where. You start off, you have your initial 1861, early 1862 battles, and the AI attacks, 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 advances, tries to slip around you, captures forts, besieges forts, and then they reach a point and they just stop. There seems to be some kind of little tipping point where they just run out of steam. And I think AI Union has reached that point in this campaign. Okay, Johnson is at uh, Memphis. Let's see if uh, 
he, I enabled all the transport modes for him. Let's see if he will take the river to Fort Smith, Arkansas. He will. Off you go. Sort of. Looks like he's going to take the railroad to Little Rock, and then he's going to take the river up to uh, Fort Smith. I mean, we saw how just time after time, the, these two armies up here kept butting heads right into St. Louis. And they stopped doing that. Jackson is green. Barely. We'll wait here. We'll wait a couple weeks for April and then the winter weather penalties will go away on April 1st. Like right now, the weather is okay and the temperature is actually up into the 40s but if we started moving we would still have the slower winter movement and uh, increased attrition <clears throat> so we'll bide our time I'm gonna go ahead and form our naval fleet it's gonna be the CSN Confederate States Navy Battle Squadron of course, they wouldn't put CSN in the name. That would be redundant. We'll build it at Mobile. Under the command of... Franklin Buchanan. And let's see if it lets us put the Virginia in it. It does. And all these frigates. It'll take a little while for these ships to get there and to finish building CSS Virginia. Let's go ahead and put one of these in there too. Let's put the Tennessee in this force. And this is Battle Squadron 1 or Batron 1 for a sort of acronym. It's a little anachronistic. That's more something like a 20th century U.S. Navy <laughs> kind of term. But Battle Squadron 1 will soon be ready for action in the Gulf of Mexico. I hope in the meantime the Union has not loaded up this squadron with like ironclad monitors. Oh, let's see what kind of uh, what kind of additional ships do we have that we did not have before. So now that we didn't have, ah, we can build the ironclad frigate which is a very large seagoing ironclad of 18 guns. That costs almost 10,000 wood, 2,300 iron, <laughs> and six, 680,000 costs. Ooh, that's expensive. If I hit build right now, this war will probably be over before it completes. Golly, that's tempting, though. It also sucks up 5,000 shipyard capacity. Which? Okay, I'm the first to admit, this is a bad decision. I'm going to build four of them. <laughs> 
don't do this at home, kids. That was a that was a dumb thing to do. We also have a whole bunch of uh, ironclad gumboat rams ready. Yeah, I had one, two, three, four. I had five more casemate ironclads like Virginia building, and they're not that far along. But I got a whole bunch of these uh, smaller ironclads. We're, we could actually build that riverine force. I've also got four ten-clad gunboats, which are only river capable. That's why they're showing red. If I skipped to a different fleet, these would be available. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's form a, a a river squadron. And I think. I think Memphis would be the place to do that. Up the river there, close to Cairo. Under the command of... Who is our best leadership? Yeah, our available Commodores are... Okay, Paige is about the best commander we have. Looks like Raphael Sims is going to be the commander of the Rivron. And we'll plug, uh, we'll put these tin clads in there. You know, the, the order that they're listed in the fleet, I don't know if that affects the order in which they engage. Let's, um, let's put these in first. We'll do four of these. And then we will put our f four ten clads in there. It probably doesn't make a difference. But just in case it does. And this will be Rifron. One. And it'll take them a while to collect up their ships and get to green readiness. Plus, CSS Virginia needs to complete building. And I kind of laid out what I intend to do here. But, but uh, so we have these three squadrons here. Mobile, Biloxi, Louisiana, and these are just made up of little crappy steamers and gunboats and crap like, you know, just small unarmored craft. They're going to go into raid mode, which means that they try to make hit and run attacks against exposed vessels in the blockading fleet. And they're going to come in here conduct raiding attacks and weaken this force. They won't win. They will lose ships. We're going to suffer three small-scale naval losses. But they will drive down readiness and do some damage. They may even sink or capture like some really small ships. They won't do that to the, the larger ones. And then once we've ground this down a little bit, we're going to bring these frigates and ironclads out to for a real naval battle. And that should drive this blockading squadron off station, at least, and lift the blockade on New Orleans, Mobile, and Biloxi, which the three taken together um, is our biggest 
uh, kind of set of ports. Norfolk is the biggest single port, but these three are all be getting blockaded by one squadron. So this is the most bang for the buck for at least temporarily defeating one of the blockading fleets. All right, time rolling. As far as I know, McDowell's army is still over here. Salisbury, Maryland. <clears throat> Don't know that for sure, but... Uh, seems like he probably is. I don't know where else he would be. You know, one thing that I, I do a lot when I'm playing Union, and I have not done here, is I will create... We've got some attrition going on here. What's the supply situation? 37%. Oh. Is it, when I took Cumberland, I... Okay. Here. Build a supply depot. Seems like he ought to be within range of this one. No, guess not. No, it's just barely outside of his command radius. Okay. One thing I do a lot, a lot as Union is I will build a bunch of little bitty squadrons of just like a couple of uh, fourth-rate steamers apiece. Not for any kind of naval action or blockading, but just to kind of fan out on the rivers and increase the intelligence picture. And I have not done that here. And I could. I could put, you know, I could make a... Especially now that I have... It's a little problematic down here because you've got this fort at Fort Monroe to get past. But I could build a little fleet of steamers just right here at Alexandria and come over and just see where McDowell is. Kind of go up and down the uh, the bay and even up into the Susquehanna River for increased intelligence. Do I even have... I don't want to use ironclads for that. I could strip off a few, like this fleet isn't actually doing anything and is unlikely to do anything for a while. So just for vision, yeah, let me just, uh, here, let's just take a little tender gumboat from Virginia. And a motor scooter from Savannah. And we'll take the gumboat from North Carolina. And we will form Alexandria Port build. Just see who the most cunning commander we have in the Navy is. So we've got Lynch, who looks like twos is about all we got. Okay. Well, Commander Lynch, you're going to have a huge command here. That seems a too highfalutin a name. You get a couple little gunboats and a schooner just to go see where McDowell is. <laughs> we shall call V 
Scout Ron. Scouting Squadron 1. Has Johnston arrived at Fort Smith? He has. And the Army of the West is now coming to... Uh... Okay, well... So this is interesting. We're supposed to defeat all the armies in Missouri to make it secede. Well, Army of the West is no longer in Missouri. Do we have better intelligence? He's still estimated at 6,500 men. Whereas Johnson has 12,000. Okay. Looks like Nathaniel Lyon is just going to accommodate us. We don't have to go chasing him all over western uh, Missouri. Maybe you have to reach a point where there are no non-retreating armies in Missouri. They're all retreating at the same time. Maybe that's what it has to be. I think Army of the West is just going to come down here and besiege this fort. and Huh. So I think we're about to have a battle, but this episode has been running for quite a while. So I'm just going to put a cut in here, and probably in the next episode we will have our first tactical battle in quite a while. And the siege is happening. But that will do for this episode. Thank you very much for watching.